we have to go a bit deeper into math and the ways signals are transported. So we have to look at periodic signals, why you'll see in a minute. So very basic signal processing, periodic signals. So that's uh, very simple signals. So periodic sinus waves, sinusoidal oscillations are often used for transmission as shown here in this first example. So how are those signals characterized? You have a period T. So you see that's the period from here to there. That's the period T. Okay. And which is basically uh, the reciprocal of the frequency. Okay. So the period indicates the duration of this period. Reciprocal is the frequency is then specified in hertz. This is when you hear something is this and that gigahertz. So that's the frequency. Then we have the amplitude shown here on the y-axis, the amplitude. And that's a function of the time here on the x-axis. So this is what we also call the time domain because we see now our wave, our signal here in as a function of the time, so time domain. But what you also see here is, is we can specify a bit more. We can also have something that is called a phase. What does it mean? Well, you see here a sine wave with a certain period, 2 pi, and we can shift the phase phi. So that indicates the displacement of the sine wave here, seen in the second example. So the idea is you can actually represent something by this, the amount of shifting a sine wave compared to the unshifted sine wave. We'll see how we do this. Okay, so these are sine waves. We can also have a look at more, this is, as you can assume, this is analog uh, and kind of analog uh, signal. We can also look at this uh, discrete, discrete value signal, a square wave. So there are different ways uh, we can actually uh, have waves for this sine waves, square waves, and then there are some others. The question is, can something like a square wave exist in nature? So this is something we typically show when we look into a computer and say, okay, this represents, for example, a one and this represents a zero. And up here, maybe we have uh, plus five volts and this is minus five volts, just an example. But can this really be true in real nature? The point is no. Such a signal, a real mathematically ideal square wave simply does not exist in nature. The reason is, as we will see in a minute, is that for actually for really representing this square wave in nature, we'd need infinite high frequencies to represent this, requiring an infinite bandwidth in the medium. And this is something that simply does not exist. There's no infinite bandwidth in a medium, as we also see. So how can we come close to such a square wave? Because remember, these square waves, this is something we assume we have in our computer. Now let's think of, okay, we transmit this. Nature doesn't like square waves and nature doesn't like infinite bandwidth. This simply doesn't exist. So the point is that these square waves, they can be uh, approached, approached by composing, by adding different sine waves. Here shown an example where we add two sine waves with different amplitudes. So the second sine wave is only a third of the amplitude. 
as you see here, it's only a third of the uh, amplitude, but three times the frequency. So 3F, three times the frequency. And you see, so this is not this sine wave you just saw on the slide before, but you see now by adding this, well, it's not really a square wave, but we come closer. So we take two components, sine two sine waves, and add them. So, okay, we come closer. So you see, we maybe we need a bit more to really have this square wave. And to really reach this square wave, we need an infinite amount of sine waves. And if we follow this formula, we can really represent this ideal square wave with the help of sine waves. The problem for nature is, you see here, infinity. We need an infinite number of sine waves. And this k also goes here, as you see, into the frequency with an infinite high frequencies. Why? Because to create this perfect, sharp, nice edges here. So in reality, well, we cannot really reach this. You will see in a minute why this is important. So for now, think of, okay, nature likes analog signals, sine wave as an example. That's one thing. The second thing is that we can actually compose sine waves to create arbitrary periodic functions like these square waves. Okay? And I know in reality uh, the signals look a bit uh, stranger, so different frequencies, amplitudes, etc., as we'll see in a second. Hmm. So, how come that we can do this? Well, this all goes back to Joseph Fourier, a French mathematician and physicist. And he showed that actually any periodic function, so in our example, it was this square wave, so any periodic function can be constructed as the sum of a number of sines and cosines. So sines and cosines, you see here, and you can construct any periodic function. So that's the idea. So you see here, again, this infinity. And on the example on the slide before you saw, we took only the sine waves and not the cosines. So, okay, no one forces you to do both. So it depends on the periodic function. So sines and cosines. And here we add a constant. And this is something Later we'll learn this. This is our DC part, the direct current, and we are not a friend of this. And I'll come back to this. So, and the series that results from this, adding, 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 all these sums is called the Fourier series. And now what is the trick? That if you know the period and all the amplitudes, you can reconstruct the original periodic function. So all we need is the amplitudes, the period, and that's it, and we can reconstruct it. And think of uh, in a way that nature wants to transmit, if we take our periodic signal, on the left-hand side, this ideal periodic signal, if we want to transmit it, nature thinks of, okay, I transmit it as this composition. So composition of many what we then later learn as harmonics, many sine waves, cosine waves, and a DC part, so this constant. Okay, so Fourier found out we can construct all periodic functions using this formula. Hmm. What that does it mean for us? So if we have a periodic signal, think of this as something we have, uh, for example, in our computer, or nice square waves, and we'll see that there are many different ways of transmitting this. Yes, 
uh, we may think of this, but nature transmits this using a composition of sine and cosine waves. So that's the idea. Okay. Hmm. So that's so far that's theory. Why? Uh, because in ideal case we need this infinite number of sines and cosines. So now we have the real world. And the real world simply says there is no transmission without losing some power. So is this a problem? Mm, maybe. So think of all these Fourier components, all the sines and the cosines. If you diminish them equally, you still have basically the original signal, but with a reduced amplitude. Okay, fine. So what's the problem? So basically, this is just a factor, a, a single factor, uh, and you multiply this whole Fourier series with this factor. So not a real big problem. Take an amplifier and the signal is fine again. We have one big problem. Unfortunately, real world diminishes different Fourier components by different amounts. So that means, if we translate this, depending on the frequency, because these are all these frequency components of a signal, depending on the frequency, we have different attenuation, different interference, and something we call dispersion. Okay, first attenuation. What does it mean? The signal gets weaker depending on its frequency. Very simple example from everyday uh, life. So we have extreme attenuation shadowing, for example, when it comes to, let's say, uh, a wooden wall, a wall made out of wood and sunlight. No sunlight goes through. So almost 100% attenuation. But your cell phone works behind this wooden wall inside a house, for example, without any windows. So it's dark. Dark means extreme attenuation for sunlight. But cell phone works. What has this to do with frequencies? Well, sunlight and the waves that reach your mobile phone are just electromagnetic waves of different frequencies. So already from this example, you see, okay, depending on the frequency, material attenuate more or less. So real, the real world, real materials, concrete, wood, and whatever, have different attenuation depending on the frequencies. So uh, this is try to shine bright light through a copper wire. That's another example. A copper wire may guide easily a signal with 10 megahertz, but not with several terahertz as light. So we have something that's called frequency dependent attenuation. So you weaken different frequencies at different percentages, up to 100%. That they are, the signal is completely gone. So now think, our signal, now this ideal signal is composed in nature by this overlying sines, cosines of different frequencies. And now nature comes and filters out certain frequencies and leaves only some of the frequencies, some parts of the spectrum then this clearly is not our original signal anymore. We may have interference, which is different on different frequencies. Think of your normal uh, uh, wireless LAN. If your neighbor chooses the same transmission channel, you have interference on this frequency, but not on other frequencies. And quite similar, you can have certain interference that really hurts only some of the frequencies. And then we have something I will come back when we talk about optical transmission that's called dispersion. So dispersion is the phenomenon in which the what we call the phase velocity, so the, the speed of the light of the wave depends on the frequency. Oh, what does it mean? So if you have an optical fiber, we have 
different components with different speed. So if you shine with your flashlight white light into this fiber, then the white light contains some, let's say, part of red, red waves, red waves, but this bright light also uh, contains uh, whatever, maybe a different color, maybe also blue light, and maybe this also contains some green light, whatever. The problem now is that the speed, physics called the phase velocity, of the waves of the red, blue and green depends on the frequency. We as humans, we don't say, oh, uh, what a nice frequency, we say, what a nice color. So color frequency, that's basically the same. And so we have different speeds. So we have some colors, some frequencies that are faster. So we have faster components and we have slower components. So that means if you shine, if you just send a short pulse of white light into a fiber, there will be some components arriving earlier at the other side than others. So you might have this sharp pulse on one side and this pulse then smears into a wider pulse on the other side. Yeah, and by the way, this is why we have a rainbow. So a bit more about all these physical things. So frequencies, time. I already mentioned that typically, and this is what you know from a oscilloscope, we display our waves in the time domain. That means you see here our signal and the time is here on the x-axis. But quite often it is very useful to show your signal in the so-called frequency domain. In the frequency domain, we see the spectrum of a signal and the device is then called the spectrum analyzer. So here on the right hand side, you see an example. So you see here two peaks at 1F and at 3F, and this is exactly the same signal, but here you see the frequency components. You see the component F, and 3F. So time domain, that's the upper example, and the lower one is in frequency domain. Okay, and the spectrum now of a signal is the range of the frequency it consists of. So, uh, you will see in real signals they may be composed of many, many different frequencies. And here you see in this example, here the, our spectrum going from this F here to 3F. The bandwidth now the signal occupies is the width of the spectrum. So the bandwidth in this example is 2F. The bandwidth is important because the bandwidth will then tell us in the end how many bits per second we can transmit. So in real examples we also sometimes talk about effective bandwidth. So this is the band of the frequencies where most of the energy is contained. You will see some examples for this. So we can show signals in the time domain and in the frequency domain. And with the help of the Fourier transform, we can go from time domain into frequency domain and the inverse goes from frequency domain into the time domain. Many of the signals, in theory, they have infinite bandwidth. So maybe the spectrum looks like this, then you may, may have some more components somewhere. And maybe you have very high components, so the spectrum could look like something like this. So that's also a spectrum. And you go theoretically to infinity, not in real systems. So, and as I said, Fourier transform, that's a mathematical, mathematical transformation. 
to go from time domain into frequency and vice versa. And this exists also in two dimensions, so space frequency transform for image processing. So now we know what a signal is. We know how we can compose period signals, so help of sine waves. And then in the end, so hmm, we are interested in transporting bits, bits per second. So how does this all come together? So now we come to the bit rate of a channel, of a real channel, of a theoretical channel. In the example, you see our square waves. Well, they exist in theory. Good for this example. And here we can code, for example, a bit for data into this part of the signal shown here. And if we code a bit this way, then we transmit one bit with a certain level of the signal. So we can code our bits into, for example, the voltage of the signal. Okay? And this element of a signal that carries our, in this case, single bit, we also call it a symbol. A symbol can carry a single bit, as we'll see also several bits. The duration of the symbol here, you see, is half the period. And then we can do the math and calculate also the symbol rate. In this case, it's 2f bits per second. Here it's very simple. We only have one bit per symbol. In this case, the data rate equals the symbol rate. So symbol 1 carries the bit with the value 1. Symbol 2 carries a bit with the value 0. So that's the idea here. These are our symbols carrying our data. Real media, they transport only certain frequencies or certain range in our spectrum. So now the next term, bandwidth, bandwidth of a medium. We see here on the x-axis frequencies, f, and we see a spectrum of a signal. Shown here with the bandwidth b, example, is spectrum, part of the spectrum, and here you see if we use a certain medium, for example, copper wire or fiber optics, and you just, you know, you use all different frequencies from zero hertz to infinity, well, the medium will only transmit a certain part of the spectrum. Shown here is it will transmit without too much attenuation, frequencies from a lower frequency, FL, to FH, a higher frequency. And the bandwidth of the medium now is defined as the highest frequency, FH, minus the lowest frequency. So real media can only transmit a part of our spectrum, shown here, and that's the bandwidth. And typically, it's defined in a way that you say, okay, the, this, the so-called cutoff frequencies are not sharp, so it doesn't stop exactly F, at FL or FH, but, well, you see these slopes, not that sharp, so, but we look at the center frequency, F0, and then we look at where is the major part of the energy. And the signal bandwidth now in Hertz, this is the frequency range, in which the signal so-called spectral density or the most of the energy is above a certain threshold. So we have a certain threshold shown here and we look, okay, where is most of, uh, let's say, the energy? And typically there's a so-called 3 dB point and uh, this is the point where the spectral uh, density is half its maximum value or the so-called spectral amplitude uh, is 70% of the maximum. So we basically 
look at a medium and then we check, okay, if we basically apply all the frequencies from zero to infinity to the medium, the medium will let through only a certain range, a certain part of the spectrum of the frequencies. And there's no sharp cutoff, but there's this slope, you see, but we will check, okay, where's the maturity of uh, the energy and if the attenuation is not too strong, as shown here, see in this range we are above, then all this is then the, I would say, the major part of the signal that goes through the medium. And we basically ignore the energy here and here and define this is then the bandwidth. And we'll come back to this bandwidth when we, at the end of the chapter, look at different media like a copper wire, like fiber optics. And for a copper wire, we say, for example, the bandwidth of this copper wire is 600 megahertz. And then this is exactly this bandwidth, so we can transmit from a certain frequency to a certain upper frequency. So that is when we talk about bandwidth of a certain medium. Okay, now we know, okay. We, what in the end, what we want to have is how to transmit our bits, our bit per second. So we, we code our data into symbol and then we send those symbols over the medium. Hmm. Okay. But what did we learn? We saw that, okay, we don't have these square waves, but nature transmits these square waves as a composition of sine waves. Now let's have a look again at this composition. We can use one frequency f, three times f, five times f, seven times f. Or if you want to make it perfect, we learned that, okay, we need an infinite number of components. So that's back in theory because this requires infinite high frequencies. They do not exist. So no matter what we do, well, maybe we come close, but there will always be uh, these little waves and there's an upper limit because we also learned that a medium has certain limitations. It's only what we call a band pass. So there's a lowest frequency and a highest frequency. You can transmit over a certain medium. And if you go lower or higher, well, there will be a cutoff. The medium cannot transport higher frequencies. So the example, use a flashlight and a copper wire. It simply doesn't work. So this infinite number of components, that doesn't work. So these components, they're also called harmonics. And I will, will give you an example for this. So we compose our signal out of these sine waves, call them also harmonic, and we reduce the amplitude of the kth harmonic to 1 over k. But we just learned that there's an upper frequency. So that means in this summing up the sine waves, there, there will be a stop somewhere. So there is an upper limit. But what happens? What happens if this k is limited? So you see here, the more frequencies we use, the better we can approach this nice square wave. If we only use three weak frequencies, well, it's not that good compared to four, compared to an infinite number. But we don't have the bandwidth for an infinite number. So what happens? So coming back to the harmonics. Harmonics you know from music, for example. So that's the, uh, the vibrations of a string. As shown here on the right-hand side, you see vibrations of a string and uh, you have so-called harmonics. These are integer multiples of a so-called fundamental frequency of a periodic system. So this exists in physics, acoustics, telecommunications. So the harmonic is your sine wave with a certain frequency and then you have the integer multiples. Okay, so fundamental frequency, our first harmonics. And then you have the higher harmonics. But what happens? You see now on the left side, we want to transmit our ones and our zeros. And now we assume higher and higher bandwidth of a medium. If the bandwidth is pretty low, 
only the fundamental frequency in this example or the first harmonic can go through. So mm, yes, oof. can we still read the original signal out of this, this sine wave? I have my doubts. So if the bandwidth is limited to maxima in this example 500 hertz, you see only the first harmonic goes through this. If we use more and more and more harmonics, you will see how we can more and more adapt to the real ideal signal. That's just an example. So we want to transmit certain data at a certain rate, two kilobit per second, and then we use this digital signal and we try to transmit the digital signal over our classical real medium. And depending on the bandwidth that is available, you see the differences in the shapes of the signal we can really transmit. So although we, let's say, apply this digital signal to our medium with this nice rectangular square shapes representing the zeros and the ones, if the available bandwidth is only 500 hertz, the signal will look like this first sine wave because only the first harmonic will go through. The medium will filter out the higher harmonics. And why do we have these higher harmonics? Well, because we compose, well, nature composes this signal, this rectangular signal, with the help of sine waves. That was the idea. And here it tells you, okay, if we have higher and higher bandwidth, we can go to a better and better representation of the signal. Hmm. So, yeah, great. Now, that's, that's physics. So we have our signals and somehow uh, nature adapts them. Let's do the harmonics. But what does it really mean? So if we look at our signals, we typically have the binary signals. We have to learn something in addition. We can do a bit more. We cannot only code a single zero and one, a single bit per symbol. We can have something that's called multi-level signals. Okay, so we can have digital signals with more than two possible values. So we can code two different values in one signal, in one symbol, so having two levels. We could also have three, four, five on the right hand side. You see an example, four, five levels. What does it mean? Well, in our classical computer, you have two values, zero volts and five volts, for example. And you code a single bit by either five volt or zero volt. Why not coding more than one bit in a symbol? Okay, how does it look like? Here we have an example of four different levels. So we have amplitudes, minus one, whatever volts, for example, plus one, plus two, minus two, and a signal. Now we can say, okay, plus two equals a code, this case a quaternary code of one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And if we now go through this example, Simple by simple, so we take this simple for example, this already represents zero one. So what we can code is now two bits per simple, two bits, not only a single bit. So why not coding two bits per simple? Okay, so clever idea, the classical binary signal has only one bit per symbol. So we can code 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. Now we code 2 bits per symbol. Okay. So that means we can transmit more bits per symbol. Hmm. So one of the questions is, why not introducing even more levels? Okay. So if we now have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight levels, that well, sounds good. Then we could code 
actually three bits. Okay, why not having three bits? Per symbol. Okay, why not? Then, etc., we could code here, for example, this symbol uh, is already 111. So then we have three bits per symbol. Cool. Uh, okay, so why not going to even more? Great idea. What is the big advantage if we transmit more and more bits per symbol? Well, we just saw on the last slide that bandwidth of the medium limits the number of harmonics. If we transmit our bits in this binary coding, then what can happen in the worst case, we create such a signal. If we code it in a special way, so so-called non-return to zero code, we will see these examples then we could create such a pattern. And this requires relatively high frequencies compared to if we now, for example, combine always three bits, then this would be a signal of a certain level. Next three bits is another level, etc. So, way fewer potential signal changes. And this results in a lower requirement when it comes to bandwidth. Because if we have fewer signal changes, we don't need that high frequencies compared to this one bit per symbol. We need many more, well, potential signal changes to transmit the bitstream. So this bitstream with the simple Binary coding, assuming the same data rate in bit per second, creates higher frequencies. But we just saw that we have bandwidth limitations, we have an upper frequency, we cannot go arbitrary high, so we code more bits in a symbol. That means the maximum we need is lower, lower maximum frequency. So that's cool because then we can transmit high data rates even if the medium is bandwidth limited, there's an upper frequency. That's cool. So why don't we just do this? Well, the problem is here on the left side. You go closer and closer and closer. In theory, you can code an arbitrary number of bits in a single symbol. In practice, you have a problem and it's called noise. So the real uh, signal looks, oops, looks more like this. So if the distance between these values on the y-axis, if they are too close, you cannot decide what the real value is. And this causes bit errors. Because if for example, here you have a certain noise, then you might decide, oh, this belongs to a certain code, which might be wrong. So, yes, we could go to these multi-level digital signals. We can code more and more bits per symbol, but then in real systems, we run into the problem of noise, which makes it more and more difficult to decode the signal without errors. But if we go to fewer bits per symbol, we need higher frequencies. So this must be balanced. We'll see examples for this. Okay, so symbol rate, bit rate. Some more definitions. We already saw what a symbol is. So this is a part of our signal representing one or several bits, typically several bits in today's systems. You could also have examples where several symbols represent one bit. So symbol rate 
in the end is the number of physical signaling events per unit of time. So that is, you potentially you change the signal level. And there's also a, a unit called board. And so that's the symbol rate. An example for this. So here we see a signal and within one second you have one, two, three, four, five of these signaling events, potentially signal level changes. It's not necessary, but you see here, here nothing changes, but you have these potentially these five signal changes, so five signaling events within one second. So the symbol rate is five baud. This example, well, we can only code one bit for example, zero, just to make it different, we code ones as low voltage, for example, and zero as high voltage. Well, it's up to you how you define it. Then we also have a bit rate, in this case, of five bit per second. Be aware. Only in this case, only for these binary signals, the bit rate equals baud. As soon as we code more bits per symbol, this is not true anymore. So symbol rate is the number of signaling events. We have to distinguish this from data rate. Data rate, that's how many bits we can decode from these symbols per unit of time. And this is where we have our bit per second. And only for the binary signals, then we can say each signal event, that means each symbol codes a bit. So only for binary signals, we can say, okay, this is our one symbol, one bit. But for multi-level signals, which is the common case today, where we have n possible values, we can calculate then the data rate by v times log n. So it depends on the coding. So for example, if you have three levels, then one board equals three bit per second and so on. Okay. And now, so now finally, we are at the bit per second. This is what we typically are used to in computer science. So we don't typically deal with the symbols or signals. And then bit per second, and uh, we have different uh, symbols. Uh, there are bit per second, kilobit, megabit per second, gigabit, etc. Um, and it's quite important to see we in telecommunication we also use bytes and kilobytes and all this. And just by the way, quite often in telco standards, you find the octet because we have eight bits in one byte. Um, and here for communication, it's fully correct also to say kilobit because here we operate with powers of 10, like in the normal metric system, kilometer, kilogram. So, but don't mix this with the storage people. So they operate with powers of two, which is not the same. So it's close. So uh, two to the power of 10 um, is then um, 1024. So almost 1,000. So important to note, storage technology different from transmission technology. So now we defined not only what a signal is, but also symbols and data rates in bit per second, symbol rates, and you should know what the differences are because we have these multi-level signals. And remember, Yes, we can go to many, many levels, but noise will then be a problem. Okay, 
Now coming back to these uh, problems of our bandwidth limitations, where do you see this in everyday environment? I gave you some examples, but you will quite sure will come up with some more problems here and some more bandwidth limitations you know. And what are then the effects of the bandwidth limitation? So what does it mean? So if we have an arbitrary signal and we transmit it through a medium, what happens? And talking about signals, what can distort a signal during transmission? So we are not automatically in, our, in a vacuum without any interference. So what can happen? Then you should have learned what is the difference between board, symbols per second and bit per second. So is this the same or when is it the same? And then this classical tricky question. So uh, quite often if you buy a uh, SSD, so hard drive, solid state disk, so it's written uh, on it. So the uh, capacity is one terabyte. Okay, so um, how long does it take to transfer this one terabyte, ignoring uh, overheads, etc. This one terabyte to transfer it over one gigabit per second fiber. First of all, you have to think, what does this typically mean? Is this the correct way of writing it, etc.? But what does it mean and how long does it take? 